Well, welcome everyone to African Philosophy Conversations. Uh, it is my great privilege today to uh, be talking with uh, Professor Suleiman Bashir Dianya. Um, and uh, he is a philosopher at, uh, uh, at Columbia University. Uh, he's in the uh, Department of French and also philosophy. That's correct, right? You're in two departments. Yes. I and teach philosophy, French philosophy in the French department and philosophy, Islamic philosophy mainly, and also sometimes logic in the philosophy department. And you're also the director of the Institute of African Studies at Columbia, is that right. correct? Correct. Right. So you wear many hats, um, which uh, I can appreciate. And so it's it's a real pleasure because I've, I've uh, really... Um, that uh, really loved your writing and, uh, and and the work that you've done in the past. And so I look, I'm looking forward to this uh, conversation. And I guess the place I usually like to start is uh, to get you to tell me a little bit uh, about how you got into philosophy in general and uh, African philosophy in particular. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, let me say about my choice uh, uh, to, to become a philosopher. Uh, first, I was headed towards uh, a career as uh, an engineer. This is oh. how I thought of myself, how I saw myself uh, during my uh, uh, secondary education. And uh, up to the moment when I traveled to France to continue my higher education, I was hesitating between uh, going to a school of engineering where I was accepted and going to do what I eventually did, which is go to this very French system of class preparatoire, then Ecole Normale Supérieure, where I had as my mentors and, uh, and uh, professors, uh, Althusser, Derrida, Potra, uh, which I did eventually. So uh, I ended up deciding to, to follow that second path, mm -hmm. philosophy, mainly at the time because of two things. I would say a kind of speculative turn of mind that I would say I inherited from my father and <clears throat> from many conversations I had with him. I've always uh, been among my father's uh, books. Uh, his library was very rich in philosophy. Mm -hmm. Himself was just a civil servant working for the mm -hmm. uh, 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 posts. Uh, post offices in, in Senegal, but his real life was really the life of a theologian and a, and a philosopher and a thinker. So I had this background, which was very strong in my education. And I guess that is a, a very important aspect of my final decision. Another aspect of that decision was what was my, my politics at the time, to, 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 to put it in under one name, I would say Jean-Paul Sartre. Somehow I identified myself with Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy, Jean-Paul Sartre's political uh, engagement, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So in the end, uh, I stayed in Paris because uh, following the, that path meant for me staying in Paris instead of going to the city of Lyon, which is also a beautiful city mm -hmm. in France, uh, where I would have been uh, uh, a student at uh, Institut National des Sciences Appliquées, mm. uh, which was a, a school for uh, engineering, which mm. was an engineering school, a school of engineering. So uh, this is how I decided to, 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 to follow my, my passion, which was really ideas and discussion and argumentation and philosophy, philosophy in, a, in, a, in a word. Uh, I did that. I uh, uh, was, uh, um, I, succeeded in getting into Ecole Normale, having a, a, a good, uh, being in good schools. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and after I finished my higher education, I decided to go back to Senegal. Now, one way in which I reconciled my love for mathematics and my passion for philosophy was a specialization in the philosophy of sciences and in the history of algebraic logic. I took a few certificates in mathematics after my, uh, I completed my degrees in, in philosophy and I finished my aggregation and uh, uh, dissertation. And then I, uh, that dissertation was written on Boolean algebra. Oh. Uh, and my first two books actually were published in that field mm -hmm. of Boolean algebra, uh, a study of Boolean algebra 
in the first place, uh, title in French, uh, Boule, l'oiseau de nuit en plein jour, and also uh, a translation into French uh, with a big introduction and notes of Boule's uh, magnum uh, opus, which is an investigation of the laws of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that was, uh, uh, so by the time I went back to Senegal, to uh, have a position in the Department of Philosophy, my goal was really to develop there uh, mm -hmm. a curriculum in the history and philosophy of sciences in particular, in, and also a teaching in logic, mm -hmm. which I did. I, I created the curriculum. And now that I'm not in Senegal anymore, but uh, here at Columbia, actually former, uh, former students of mine are the ones who teach mm. those classes. I also now, while I was there, I would say that life happened because <laughs> you, you never stay uh, uh, enclosed in one right. uh, narrow specialization or, or, or field when you are uh, a philosopher. Right. As uh, uh, Deleuze said, you encounter problems. You come across problems and you have to deal with them. And what was the problems one would encounter when one is teaching philosophy in Africa? Mm -hmm. Well, the question of African philosophy, right. obviously. The philosophical problems that, um, that may not be specifically African per se, but have definitely an African uh, 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 um, coloration, if I may mm. use in, uh, uh, that word, attached to them because mm. you are looking at them uh, from an African perspective. Mm. For example, the question of art, uh, what is African art, and so on, so forth. So I, I became, I contributed to the general debate that was uh, uh, taking place in, uh, on the continent. You have to remember this, I'm talking about the 80s. Right. with this fierce debate about ethno-philosophy versus uh, 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 international philosophy or universal philosophy, all that kind of debates. And I, I was part of that debate. I contributed to it. And, I, uh, um, and also something else, which was on the ground, very much on the ground, was Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because, again, we are talking about the, the, the late 80s, Mm -hmm. at a time when political Islam was very much on the, uh, uh, on the front pages of many newspapers and on television, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we just thought in my department at Sheikh Antadiyob University that as a, a, a country, a Muslim country, we could not ignore uh, mm -hmm. uh, the teaching of the intellectual and spiritual tradition that Islam is also, in other words, great philosophers who contributed to universal philosophy, such as uh, Al-Farabi, Avicenna, Averroes, needed to be taught, to be brought to the, to the attention of our students and discussed. And uh, this is where my, uh, what I've called earlier, my speculative turn of mind, which mm -hmm. is uh, uh, the kind of conversation I had with my father and the, the, the particular education I got from my father who was mainly a theologian, that is where it was, it came, it, it came handy uh, and useful because I could teach that course. Right. Not uh, uh, thanks to my formal training, which was in philosophy of science and logic mainly, but because of that family background that I, that I had. So this is how in the field of philosophy, I built these three uh, 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 subfields of mine where mm -hmm. I do research and I write books and articles, mainly history of philosophy in general, uh, uh, um, philosophy of science and algebraic logic, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Islamic philosophy, mm -hmm. and actually make it four, let's make it four, the other one being obviously uh, African right. uh, philosophy. Well, I mean, there's so many things to follow up on in, in what you just said. Um, you know, I think your Deleuze, uh, passing Deleuze comment is is absolutely right. You know, uh, we, we are presented with problems and we, uh, you know, when we react to them, 
Um, you know, I'm interested in uh, one of the areas that you have uh, uh, focused on, and that is the work of Leopold Sedar Senghor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's... I guess we could say sometimes got a bit of a bad rap in African philosophy. Uh, you know, maybe it's Wally Shoyinka's fault. I don't know. Um, but uh, there's this image of negritude that was developed in the 1920s, which uh, becomes quite essentialist, uh, you know, a, a kind of African essence versus a Western, uh, you know, uh, or European essence. And your work has uh, been, uh, you know, to kind of dispel that misunderstanding of, of who Sanghor actually was. So can you tell me a little bit about how you do that and what led you to Sanghor? Was it simply, uh, you know, uh, being from Senegal or was it something more than that? Well, there is, there is a, a kind of contingent aspect to it, but uh, there is something ob obviously deeper than that. The, the, the contingent aspect of it is that uh, back then in uh, 1996, uh, I was tasked with the mission of organizing uh, a conference mm. celebrating the 90th anniversary of Leopold Sedar Senghor mm. at the university, at the Shehan Tejob University, mm -hmm. which was an important event because uh, uh, by then Senghor had uh, left politics and power uh, uh, almost 20 years uh, uh, before. Right. So that the, 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 the political dust had settled right, in a way right. and people could uh, have a, a, a different relationship uh, with uh, his legacy. Mm -hmm. That was one aspect. The second aspect is that it was really the will of the university itself to conduct a reflection on uh, the three dimensions of this man Mm -hmm. uh, the head of state, the statesman that he was, the right. poet right. that he was, right. and the philosopher right. that he was. So rereading Senghor afresh was an exercise that changed many things for many people. I remember mm -hmm. again that most of the presentations and the contributions coming from colleagues from that uh, from uh, Shehan Tejob University was to say, you know, when you read Senghor, in, in a very precise and calm uh, 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 way, you discover uh, the, a new depth mm. to his, uh, his legacy. First of all, uh, at that time, uh, 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 Senegal was considering that uh, uh, actually the, the, the institutions created by Senghor, who is in, in many aspects, in many, uh, the, the founding father of the country, right. had, uh, uh, had revealed themselves to be really precious and mm. something that was very important and something that Senegalese people uh, were proud of. Because, I mean, the, the quality of Senegalese democracy, he did not create the democracy. I mean, even before him, Senghor, uh, Senegal had this particular position in the French empire, having these four cities where uh, uh, inhabitants were French citizens. So they had a tradition of democratic and multi-party votes, et cetera. But he really created the institutions of a fairly democratic modern state. Mm -hmm. That was one aspect. His poetry obviously had been always celebrated even right. by people who were very opposed to him. Everybody would recognize that he's one of the greatest poets of the 20th century in French right. language. Right. Now his philosophy, rereading it, obviously if you, 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 you encounter and you are right pointing towards that, the essentialist language, mm -hmm. probably the essentialist language encapsulated in, a, in an infamous formula such as uh, uh, um, you know, emotion is is black as uh, 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 rationality. Reason is uh, Hellenic, things like that. Uh, but now, when you read everything in the details, the way in which he responded to that, or the way in which actually he responded even to Volishoyinka, mm. you discover a new depth of his thinking. People mm. know. Uh, Shoyinka's witticism about the tiger not uh, singing his tigritude. Right. Nobody really, well, very few people read Senghor's answer, which was this. Well, Shoyinka, you are right. But the reason for that is the tiger is a beast. 
<laughs> and what defines the human being as the human being is that his or her being is always in question. This was a very Heideggerian answer. Yes. And philosophically, Senghor was right. So mm. the laughter was on the side of Shoyinka, obviously. But right. philosophically, by saying that, the only being for whom being itself is a question, that is what defined the human being. So this is just an example of what it means to pay more attention to what he wrote. This, right. People have been more dismissive of him without reading him precisely by saying, okay, this is an, a counter essentialism responding right. to colonial essentialism. Right. There is much more to that. And in particular also, when you start reading him in conversation with the philosophers that he read himself, mm. So what is, what is the role played by Bergsonism in Senghor's right. thinking? What is the role played by Marxism? Because right. one should be paying more attention to what he had to say about African socialism. Right. And in particular, what it meant for him to read Marx by putting emphasis more on the so-called young Marx, the Marx before the mm. manuscript of 1844, Right. than the marks of the capital. Right. And what that reading had to do with what he called the humanism of socialism, uh, uh, contrary to uh, the you know, affirmations such as that of Althusser about uh, uh, anti-humanism of Marx, et cetera. Right. So these are all examples of what it meant at that time to reread Senghor afresh and go beyond the dismissiveness of just saying, oh, right. this is essentialist thinking, negritude is essentialist thinking, et cetera. I wonder, I wonder if, oh, sorry. Yeah. I no, wonder no, no. if also- and This is what, what happened during that conference. Yeah. And then a, a, a few years later, I was invited to give a series of lectures on Senghor. Mm. And my book on Senghor, my rereading of Senghor, came out of that series of lectures that I gave for many French institutes uh, mm -hmm. in America, in the Caribbean. I traveled mm -hmm. a lot for that celebration. Right. Yeah. Well, I and I wonder if, um, you know, there's a certain, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned Bergson and also Heidegger in this context. I wonder if there's a certain attitude towards temporality uh, in, in the, I guess, misunderstanding of Senghor. I mean, it strikes me, especially with so someone like Senghor, that it was very, I suppose you could say, past-oriented. In other words, it was, a, it was seen as an excavation of something essential about, uh, uh, you know, Black existence, when in fact, a great deal of negritude was actually very forward-looking. In other words, what, what can we create? Who can we be? What does it mean to become, you know? Exactly. And, that, and is, that, is, that is absolutely right. And this is a fundamental misunderstanding of, of Senghor. Yeah, he's uh, ori uh, oriented toward the past. People forget, for example, among the philosophers with whom he was in conversation, uh, the one prominent uh, philosoph such philosopher was Gaston Berger, the so-called mm -hmm. father of what is called in French prospective, mm -hmm. uh, uh, future looking, etc. Mm -hmm. And Bergson himself, actually, when Senghor says that, in a way, the 20th century started really in 1889, mm -hmm. what he is uh, uh, saying here is that the first book published by Bergson, the uh, uh, essay on the imme immediate data of consciousness, which is mm -hmm. the literal title in French, the, the English translation is time and free will. Right. But that book is essentially about a new concept of time. Mm. And so by being a thinker of time mm -hmm. and real time, not the serial time, the spatialized time of our watches, mm. Bergson really renewed uh, something fundamental in Western uh, uh, philosophy, right. something right. that was somehow lost Right. Uh, after Aristotle spatialized the notion of time by defining uh, uh, time as the number of movement uh, right. relative to the before and the after. This was a spatial way of translating right. time. You turn time into distance mm -hmm. instead of thinking time as 
duration right. as right. really right. Uh, uh, the the becoming of of being, not the enemy of being. Because right. if you think of time in a Platonist way, you are, you you think that time can only deteriorate mm -hmm. uh, 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 being, can only be uh, yes. being deterioration and loss. Right. Uh, ontological uh, loss instead of thinking of time precisely on uh, uh, the condition for right. uh, uh, becoming in, in that positive what Bergson called the evolution creatrice and Senghor is a Bergsonian, right. Senghor is a Bergerian mm -hmm. and yes indeed he was more preoccupied by what Africanity is going to become than what it was in the past. And this is a fundamental misunderstanding that needs to be corrected, is yeah. being corrected. I mean, many, many uh, works, uh, 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 in addition to mine, have really been recently a rediscovery of mm. Senghor uh, uh, on his own terms. Mm. When, um, you know, I, I'm interested in this in the context of African philosophy as such, and, and, and more broadly than Senghor, perhaps, I mean, if somebody is, you know, encountering African philosophy for the first time in an undergraduate course, and the topic of time comes up, it's almost invariable that you go to John Mbidi and have a certain kind of version of, you know, the, as he puts it, Sasa and Zamani, you know, these two kinds of uh, experiences of time in a short, short term and uh, you know, mostly looking back and very, a very fuzzy kind of future. And it, it seems to me that's always been somewhat unfortunate to, to reduce, you know, an African sensibility of time to what Mbidi is doing, whatever its merits might be, it has a very uh, tenuous relationship with the future. And so reinscribing uh, Senghor as somebody who's very much oriented in that direction seems to me to be a bit of a, a corrective or, a, or another way of thinking about it within an African context compared to, to John Mbidi. Mm -hmm. I, I agree totally because uh, uh, Mbidi's perspective, the very notion of an African uh, experience of time that would be different from a European experience of time is quite essentialist because yeah. not only do you essentialize an African conception of time in, in, uh, when you talk about that, but then you essentialize a European conception of time itself. Yeah. Right. Building the uh, uh, European epistemology or Western epistemology as uh, built upon an homogeneous, linear, progressive notion of time as opposed to cyclical or otherwise circumvoluted notions of time <laughs> right. coming from other cultures right. is just a simplification. It is real ignorance of what constitute Western time in the first right. place. Right. Uh, it, it has not been always this, the, the case that you would have the same time in this part of Europe and in this other part. Right. It took, for example, the organization of uh, railroads and et cetera, the development of Absolutely. railroads to create this need for having the same time in two different places so that you could say the train leaves at this time and arrives at that time. You have to homogenize. So it was not just some conception yeah. coming from European mind to have this homogeneous time. It was really the capitalist conditions of the development of industrial revolution that created these yeah. notions. So and, and, and that's really a great a, example of reducing time to space as well, isn't it? I mean, you know, exactly. It is. It is yeah. really that serial time that Bergson uh, uh, said was not real thinking right. of, of time. Right. And on the other on the other side, basically reducing uh, uh, the notion of uh, of African experience of time to this concrete notion of time, as uh, Mitty was insisting, forgetting, by the way, and this is some criticism I, I wrote about his forgetting the real the real, the philology of the terms he was using himself, <laughs> Sasa and Zamani are obviously Swahili words. Yes. They are Arabic words in the first place. Of course. So they Which, carry also the yes. weight of their Arabic root yes. and significance. And if you pay attention to that, then you are much more careful before you have all these very general uh, right. uh, um, uh, statements about an African experience of time that uh, BT, BT, BT had. But of course, you and I agree that uh, beyond that, 
his book is a fantastic, uh, a great classic of African philosophy. It, it's really important. I mean, you know, some of the work I've done on it really is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in some ways a very simple read, which is to kind of go outside of what I call the 14 pages, uh, exactly. which is, you know, yeah. one chapter that everyone goes to on time, and the book is 300 pages long. Sure. And it becomes a whole lot more complex as you look at the rest of the book. You exactly. Know. And you, what you just say is what I'm saying a propos senor as well. Right. And you could say it also even for uh, Placid Temples, like Philosophy Bantu. I think really when we deal with African philosophy, this is the time when we should be reading all these classical texts more calmly, yeah. acknowledge the essentialist and quite often unacceptable aspects but then looking at the philosophical significance of these books and rereading them afresh, yeah. Well, and you know, I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned temples because I wanted to get into in the Ink of the Scholars, one of your books, you talk about an ontology of living force. And it seems to me that that kind of ties into a lot of what we've been talking about here, uh, it ties into Bergson certainly. You know, and for, for some people, there's this sense of, I guess we could say vitalism which is, uh, has got this very kind of um, metaphysical, almost animist feel to it. There are spirits of, you know, uh, uh, things that are all connected together somehow. But that's not really what Bergson was trying to do. And it's, it's not clear that that's even what Temples was trying to do. So I wonder if you could kind of expand on that ontology of living force notion. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, it, it has nothing to do with animism. If we go right. back to the, uh, the, the, this conversation between Senghor and Bergson and the encounter between Senghor and Bergson, Bergson Bergson's book published in 1907, uh, L'Evolution Creatrice, uh, Creative Evolution, looks at what I would call an emerging cosmology. Mm. Uh, the word is not made once and for all. It is the, the cosmology, our cosmology is an emerging, continuously emerging cosmology. That is the fundamental notion that you see in Bergson's uh, creative evolution. To exist is to change. Mm. And this is because uh, you have this initial fundamental primordial push of life. And this push of life is manifesting itself. It is not something that ended. Mm. If you want to speak about it in theological terms, you would say that the creative act of God is not something that is done once and for all. Right, it right. is at work in the word continuously. Mm -hmm. And Senghor organized the encounter because, between that Bergsonian philosophy of Elan Vital mm -hmm. and what he considered to be his own experience and his reading also of, of anthropologists of Africa Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, in, uh, in, in looking at this uh, uh, pervasiveness of the, of the notion of life. Right. Anthropologists have made this remark, which is just a fact, that many African prayers are prayers for an increase of life. Mm -hmm. And so this is how Senghor thought of this uh, ontology of life, of the force of life, that would be uh, that would be the ontological foundation mm -hmm. of everything that exists. To exist is to be a force, mm -hmm. to be alive and, and 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 a force. And this goes, as he said, from God, who is the force of all forces, to the pebble. Mm -hmm and the pebble itself. So meaning that even mineral things exist because they are forces, they are lives. Nothing is inert in this world. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, one good uh, uh, field in which to, to see the, the validity of this ontology is African art. Mm. The, Fundamentally, what Senghor did, and this is my, my, my thesis and my contention in the book I wrote uh, on, on Senghor, basically what he did was to see that ontology of force, of vital force, as the key to understanding African art. Because what he was saying is that the visual forms of African classical art as the 
are the visual language, constitute the visual language of an ontology of forces. Mm. And in fact, when you follow his reading of African art, in particular, when he analyzes in a very precise way certain pieces of art, you can see how this works very well mm. as a philosophy of African, African art. I have met Senghor, by the way, oh. and I have had this, uh, this uh, great opportunity as a young man to, uh, uh, to walk around his, uh, the, 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 the pieces and the art he had at his home, oh, wow. explain to me. <laughs> wow, that's great. <laughs> In, 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 in those terms, I, and yeah. this is one of my my uh, you know, best memories of, of Senghor, yeah. who we wow. met then. Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. that's great. Well, mm. so um, I'm interested in bringing in another aspect, which uh, we we touched on briefly at the beginning, which and that is um, how how Islam works into all of this. I mean, you know, the history of Islam goes back in Africa, practically to the beginning of Islam, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there are, uh, you know, the, the, the great centers of learning and great repositories of texts and, and those sorts of things. And, and you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, taking seriously uh, Islam within a uh, uh, Senegalese context. Can you expand on that a little bit? And, and does it, does it have any um, uh, uh, relationship to the kinds of things you've been talking about in terms of ontology or, or temporality or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, my work on, on Islam is twofold. On the one hand, it is important to, uh, as I said earlier, uh, to uh, um, remember that Islam is a, a philosophical tradition in the first place, that you have the development starting mainly in the ninth century of uh, uh, philosophy in the Islamic world, Right. Be it from the translation of Greek philosophy into Arabic and uh, and so on and so forth, and Africa was part of that. Right. Uh, uh, the 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 spread of Islam in Africa meant not just the spread of a religion; mm -hmm. it was not just a religious and political uh, 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 event. It was also a very important philosophical, cultural, and philosophical event. Mm -hmm because uh, uh, it meant also, uh, uh, you know, the development of intellectual centers such as Tumbuktu, Jene, Gao, or Koki in Senegal, other centers every, uh, elsewhere, uh, and in on the Swahili coast yes, also. Yes, yes, that, that uh, our, our mutual friend Kai Kressa uh, looks at, ooh, yes. Exactly, and, uh, and people would, would know the name of Plotinus, of Plato, of yeah. Aristotle, yeah. before one single European set foot on the African continent because they were reading these authors in Arabic in those centers. Mm -hmm. So the history of philosophy on the African continent, even if we reduce philosophy to its uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, branch, so to say, is nothing new on the African continent. Right. And also it meant also that written erudition was present because people would comment those texts, write textbooks and et cetera. Uh, and so Africa was not married with orality. So the whole question, the whole discussion about African philosophy happened uh, questioning the possibility for, for orality to be mm -hmm. the support of philosophical thinking in total ignorance of an, another tradition, which was this erudite written right. tradition of studying and writing philosophy right. in, in the African continent. That was one side mm -hmm. of, of it. The other side obviously being also uh, now the contribution of, of uh, Africa itself to, uh, uh, um, to the religion of, of, of Islam and the way in which in particular uh, Islamization did not mean the eradication or the suppression of these cosmologies that we right. mentioned earlier, the cosmology of the, uh, of the force, the, the living force, but in some respect, the translation of those cosmologies mm. into the Islamic cosmology. Mm. And that is something that uh, uh, authors such as Chernobyl Kartal uh, have, ha have done. And it is important to look at that. 
to look at the way in which African cosmologies found a translation into Islamic cosmology around this notion precisely of the living. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. to, to be is to be alive. Right. I've, I've written a piece uh, in the catalog of an exposition of an exhibition uh, organized recently by the Metropolitan Museum here right. on Sahel, the title is Sahel, where the question was precisely uh, uh, African art in general and Islamization and the encounter with, with Islam. Uh -huh. Instead of just thinking that Islam is this iconoclast religion which destroys everything, uh, uh, right. uh, representing anything because they hate idols and anything that looks <laughs> right. like idols. Right. It was much better to look at the way in which this encounter between the cosmology of uh, uh, these uh, uh, territories of these regions, Sahelian region, when they became Muslim, Islamization, what it meant. Right. For example, in architecture, the mm. way in which the ar Islamic architecture uh, 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 expressed this ontology of life. If you look at mosques, for example, the quintessential Islamic architecture, mm. you do not build uh, in material that you're supposed to live forever. You are not looking mm. for the eternal construction. You mm. are on the contrary, building from, uh, you know, uh, from the, 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 the mud itself mm. has a, a living material. And you are supposed to repair everything mm. you, you, you have built again and again, because it is alive. And that is what you do. You do not, mm. you are not, somehow defying time by trying to create something eternal. On the contrary, you are inscribing your own creation in time. Again, yeah. we find this notion of time. And this is, this is the uh, a way in which we can have, continue pursue this reflection on the significance of, of Islam, the philosophical significance of the presence of Islam. In, yeah, that's that's so interesting, you know, and, you know, one thing you just mentioned in passing too is, is an interesting thing, which is that notion of translation, which I know you've written on as well as a, as a as a philosophical moment as a philosophical opportunity, instead of simply, you know, here's the meaning in this place. Now we approximate the meaning in another place. This is a this is a moment of, of emergence as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I, Translation, as you have noticed, is at the center of my, of my right. work. And I believe right. that translation is an important concept because translation is opening up. Right. And the opposite is tribalism. And right. we are dying from tribalism. Tribalism <laughs> is to say, here is my identity. It is an enclosed identity. This is my experience. And if you are not like me, if you do not look like me, you do not share that experience. Yeah. which is absurd. Sharing yeah. experience is precisely translating yeah. from yeah. a context to another context. Yeah. Translation yeah. is this operation that a priori seems impossible, but in the end is always accomplished. Mm. With all the misunderstanding, all the new translation, the need to continuously translate, and you, you can meet some untranslatable, but in the end, this is the quintessentially human and humanistic concept of, uh, uh, um, you know, not being trapped in, some, in, in one's, uh, uh, in just in one's uh, identity, having what uh, uh, M.S. Césaire famously called a, a, a carceral concept right. of, 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 of uh, uh, identity and on the, sorry. No problem. <laughs> Life happens. <laughs> we go, <laughs> and uh, uh, and so translating experiences and uh, 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 is 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 important again against our the tribalism that we are witnessing today, the kind of ethno nationalism sure. that yes. we are witnessing today. Who would say? Who would have believed a few years ago that? Uh, and, and a presidential election in France would have at its center the notion of great replacement, which is <laughs> tribal thinking par excellence. Absolutely, absolutely. Only yeah, a yeah. tribe thinks that it could be replaced by another yeah, tribe. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that is the kind of tribal thinking that we have in, our, in, our, in, our, in our nowadays. And translation is, to speak the language of Deleuze, a machine de guerre yeah. against the uh, right. uh, 
enclosure or self enclosure. I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it, how the conversation has shifted, uh, you know, and I'm maybe thinking in a more Western context, but, you know, you mentioned uh, Derrida early on, you know, who in some ways it wanted to wanted to highlight the difficulties of translation at the very least and the pitfalls and the and the ways in which um you know uh, uh there's always a remainder there's always something left there's there's we never quite get it right um you know but then uh you know Deleuze turns us towards something that looks more like an opportunity rather than simply a, a you know a, a loss or a remainder sure absolutely yeah and i would i would add it to those Merleau-Ponty. Merleau-Ponty ah, yes. uh, has a very important uh, reflection in, a, in an article uh, uh, on, uh, titled in French, uh, uh, De Mauss à Claude Lévi-Strauss, From Maus to Claude Lévi-Strauss. It has mm. been translated into English. Mm. And in which he says that in our time, the, uh, our time of pluralism of cultures and languages, we are not anymore in a colonial time when Europe is at the center, Europe is the representative of the universal, and Europe is dictating to the rest of the world what mm -hmm. is universal, what is its own universality that everybody should be imitating and following. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, uh, says Merleau-Ponty, we have now to think beyond this vertical notion of universality coming from one culture that would be naturally universal and would dictate its own universality to the rest of the world, we should now, uh, 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 the task is now to think about what he called a horizontal universality or a lateral universality where cultures and languages, all of them equivalent and equal and uh, placed on the same plane of immanence mm -hmm. would contribute. They would together create a horizon of universality basically to respond to uh, uh, common, our common human condition mm -hmm. today. For example, responding to pandemics. Right. This, pan this pandemic has shown how uh, <laughs> we are one humanity. And yeah. so we have yeah. to learn to respond as one humanity. Yeah. Same thing with the environmental crisis. We have to respond to that as one humanity. Yeah. And that is an illustration of what it means to go from that kind of vertical universality where uh, Europe just thought that it was the center of the world. Uh, and in a world without a center and a periphery, therefore, mm -hmm. we have to uh, 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 create, imagine, and create that universal, that lateral universality. And translation, precisely, right. in one is one model of what it right. means to go towards. Right. Uh, lateral universality. Well, I feel like I could talk to you all day long. I mean, this is so interesting. Um, you know, I don't want to, I want to be sensitive to uh, your time, but um, I, I'll ask one last question, which is, um, how do you bring students into African philosophy? I mean, is there, is there get something you get them to read? Is there a concept or a figure that you introduce them to? Um, how do you, how do you get students uh, interested, uh, you know, um, when maybe they don't have any background? Well, uh, you know, this is a, a question people like you and I, who, are, who have been teaching African philosophy for most of our uh, philosophical right. career, uh, we, we know that this is something that you start again and again. Right. Every, every time you teach this class, you, you, you find a new entry in a way. And recently what I've been doing Currently, I would say even right now, I'm teaching a class on Bergson and Bergsonism. Mm. And when I say Bergson and Bergsonism, I look at the Bergsonism of authors such as Senghor mm. or Muhammad Iqbal, the Indian. Right. Just to talk about Senghor, this is a way in which you can bring in students who know nothing about African philosophy but are interested mm. in what that is. So when I have here uh, uh, students coming from the philosophy department, they have been magnificently trained in analytic philosophy and, they, and also in the history of Western philosophy. And they are curious about what it is that uh, uh, mm. uh, we call Islamic philosophy or 
or um, uh, uh, African philosophy. You start with something they know. Mm -hmm. And you look at the way in which Bergson, who himself never traveled, of course, to, to any colonized place, or even did not write the word colonialism once, right. still became so important for colonial subjects right. such as Segar, etc. Right. So that is a good entry point, showing that when you talk about African philosophy, you are not talking about something radically foreign, right. and that would be just a kind of distraction from the main path, right. which is the path of the history of philosophy. You show, on the contrary, that these African philosophers have written in conversation right. with what we call Western thought, and that they have written about uh, in that conversation from an African perspective. Yeah. So you teach them to see things from an African perspective, but still understand that African philosophical questions are universal philosophical right. questions, and that universal philosophical questions are African philosophical yeah. questions in this. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. You know, I mean, I think there's a danger of, um, you know, exoticizing, uh, you know, uh, African experience uh, to, to make it seem as if there's some sort of purity uh, buried in the deep distant, uh, you know, past, um, yeah. you know, when in fact, everything you've been talking about are the conversations that, that happen across borders and the translation that's necessary uh, in order to do that. But some of those borders are, within Africa itself, but some of them are elsewhere, you know, and obviously we have to, you know, be aware of the history of colonialism and the history of apartheid and slavery and all of the sorts of things that would distort those encounters, but the the encounters are still there, it seems to me. So that, that makes a lot of sense to, to kind of uh, use that as a, a kind of hook. And by the way, I would love to sit down on that seminar. It sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much for um, giving me some of your time today. And, um, you know, I, uh, I, I hope that uh, people enjoy the conversation as much as I have. Um, this has been uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Suleiman Bashir Dianya, and uh, I um, uh, will look forward to seeing you at the next uh, African um, philosophical philosophy conversations. So thanks, everyone. Great having that conversation with you, Bruce. Take care. Hey. You bet.